Welcome to our video, Viewpoints and Analysis. I would tentatively like to share some of the views and analysis of Mr. Frank Aum, senior expert on Northeast Asia at the United States Institute of Peace and former senior advisor on North Korea at the U.S. Department of Defense. The theme is, don't isolate North Korea. Why another pressure campaign would be a mistake, originally from the Foreign Affairs Report, December 22, 2022 issue. North Korea's flurry of military activity this year has put it back in the international spotlight. Stuck in a diplomatic stalemate with the United States and a self-imposed COVID-19 lockdown since early 2020, the reclusive nation has conducted more than 60 ballistic missile tests. Its highest annual total ever, including its biggest and longest launches to date. In September, North Korea enshrined in a new law the right to use preemptive nuclear strikes to protect itself. And there is growing fear that the country will carry out a seventh nuclear test in the near future, its first since 2017. This inflammatory behavior has the United States and its allies scrambling for appropriate countermeasures. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has emphasized the need to pursue additional sanctions and shore up defense and deterrence capacities, so we're not standing still in the face of provocations. In October, Cho Yun Dong, a high-ranking official in South Korea's foreign ministry, went further, vowing an unparalleled scale of response, if North Korea followed through on a detonation. In the meantime, the United States and South Korea have responded by augmenting their joint military exercises and deterrence demonstrations, such as deploying the USS Ronald Reagan near the Korean Peninsula. This slow-motion crisis has contributed to a gnawing sentiment among many analysts in Washington that the policy of denuclearization, in which Pyongyang would agree to give up its nuclear weapons program, has failed. Instead, this camp argues, the United States should accept North Korea as a nuclear state. But abandoning denuclearization is still premature for several reasons. Pyongyang has not explicitly articulated U.S. acceptance of its nuclear status as a precondition for returning to talks. Only that Washington drop its hostile policy that warranted North Korea's nuclear weapons development in the first place. Also, North Korea may have recently announced that it would never bargain away its nuclear weapons, but it made this claim before, only to recommit to denuclearization in the 2018 Singapore Statement, an agreement that it has yet to renounce. Moreover, the United States has not yet exhausted the range of promising options for coaxing better behavior from Pyongyang. Officially acknowledging North Korea as a nuclear weapon country could also precipitate nuclear weapons development in South Korea, Japan, and other countries. Perhaps most important, from a U.S. political standpoint, accepting North Korea's nuclear status would be a non-starter since it would effectively mean normalizing diplomatic and economic ties with a nuclear pariah state, something Congress would never support. And so denuclearization must remain a U.S. policy goal, even if an aspirational, long-term, or fig-leaf one, to ensure the viability of an ultimate deal with North Korea and the non-proliferation regime. Today, policymakers should focus on coming up with a new plan to get North Korea back to the negotiating table. It is unclear why the United States continues to rely on a pressure-based coercive approach that has failed to improve the security of the United States and its allies. During the last 15 years, North Korea has advanced from a rudimentary to full-fledged nuclear weapon country. Moreover, U.S.-North Korean relations have worsened from promising to non-existent. There is little mutual understanding or trust, and the tensions between them are contributing to a growing regional arms race that increases the risk of nuclear war. Nearly 70 years after the end of the Korean War, it is long past time for the United States to change tack. It should go on a peace offensive to get back to talks.
with the goal of pursuing peaceful coexistence and denuclearization in parallel. Since the end of the Korean War in 1953, the United States has dealt with North Korea largely through diplomatic isolation, economic pressure, and military deterrence. Pyongyang began to seek bilateral talks with the United States in the 1970s to replace the armistice, which ended the war, with a peace agreement. But Washington remained wary of North Korea and its desire to remove U.S. troops from South Korea. The United States was also trying to manage relations with its ally South Korea, which did not want to be excluded from talks, and broader strategic matters related to the Cold War. Washington finally began engaging with Pyongyang in 1992, after North Korea started developing a nuclear weapons program, which led to a period of consistent, albeit turbulent, negotiations over the next 16 years. Sufficient progress on denuclearization eventually led to various milestones in improved relations including a 1996 proposal for peace talks by U.S. President Bill Clinton and South Korean President Kim Young-sam. Reciprocal visits by Vice Marshal Jo Myung-rok of North Korea and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in 2000, and a performance by the New York Philharmonic in Pyongyang in 2008. By 2009, however, the United States returned to its position of deep skepticism. After the collapse of the six-party talks and North Korea's second nuclear test in May of that year, U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates warned against buying the same horse twice and suggested the United States increase pressure on Pyongyang. In December, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton asserted a policy of strategic patience to wait for talks on the United States' preferred terms. The two sides eventually resumed negotiations in 2011 culminating in the February 2012 Leap Day deal, under which North Korea agreed to temporarily halt its weapons testing and nuclear activities. But two months later, a North Korean satellite launch in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the birthday of Kim Il-sung, the country's founder, scuttled the agreement. U.S. officials have grown tired of Pyongyang's propensity for brinkmanship and its unwillingness to denuclearize. They have been chastened, too, by the hollow summitry that took place between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Today, Washington appears to have resigned itself to managing the North Korea problem rather than trying to solve it. Other than the brief negotiations in 2011 to 2012 and 2018 to 2019, three successive U.S. administrations have relied on a global pressure campaign to tighten the vice on North Korea while stopping short of instigating war. The United States has persuaded countries to downgrade diplomatic relations with North Korea, ramped up its military deterrence posture, increased interdiction and law enforcement measures and cut off North Korea's access to the dollar-based international financial system. Washington also spearheaded the imposition of major multilateral sanctions on North Korea in 2016 and 2017. These measures banned all of the country's publicly reported exports, such as coal, textiles, and seafood. This approach has succeeded in achieving limited goals. The Korean Peninsula has avoided war, and cross-border conflicts have been limited to relatively small incidents, such as North Korea's 2010 shelling of Yeonpyeong Island, and harder to attribute provocations, such as an incident in 2015. When landmines exploded inside the demilitarized zone, wounding two South Korean soldiers. In addition, the Kim regime's ability to generate hard currency, at least through legitimate means, has been significantly curtailed. North Korea's exports to China, its main trading partner, decreased 88% to $209 million in 2018 and dropped another 78% to $48 million in 2020 as a result of the country's pandemic lockdown measures. On the other hand, 
the United States approach has fallen short in realizing many other important goals. The glaring failure is North Korea's continued possession of enough fissile material to produce around 50 nuclear weapons and the ability to build six more each year. The pressure campaign also has not deterred North Korea from conducting progressively successful tests of larger yield nuclear devices and various delivery mechanisms, including long range ballistic missiles, multiple warhead payloads, mobile launchers, and underwater systems. Nor has it prevented North Korea from using illicit means to circumvent sanctions such as covert smuggling, ship-to-ship -ship transfers, and cyber theft. Perhaps the most worrisome aspect of the United States' lack of progress is its inability to improve diplomatic relations and enhance mutual understanding with North Korea. Given that Pyongyang is insecure, isolated, and impoverished, but also nuclear-armed, Washington should be taking steps to strengthen engagement, reduce misperceptions and build mutual trust to lower the risks of a nuclear war. If threat is a function of intent and capabilities, and the capabilities have become intractable, then it is imperative that the United States mitigate North Korea's negative intent. For that, isolation, pressure, and deterrence are ill-suited tools. Instead of passively dreading a nuclear test as a fait accompli, the Biden administration should proactively offer bold measures to entice North Korea back to talks. A body of literature suggests that unilateral conciliatory gestures can help dissolve mistrust and spur rapprochement, especially when offered first by the stronger country. The scholar Charles Kupchin has argued that the initiator's relative strength puts it in a better position to make accommodations since it has greater confidence that it can weather costs if the target state does not reciprocate. In the present case, the United States has the strongest diplomatic, economic, and military foundation in the world, especially when combined with South Korea's. This should allow it to take diplomatic risks. The Biden administration could begin by announcing a new approach that explicitly reinvigorates the two countries' commitment in the Singapore Statement to establish new U.S.-North Korean relations. This policy should be accompanied by unambiguous conciliatory gestures, for example, a moratorium on the deployment of U.S. strategic assets. Washington could also temporarily reduce military exercises show a willingness to declare an end to the Korean War, offer sanctions relief in exchange for commensurate denuclearization measures, end the ban on U.S. citizens traveling to North Korea, and provide humanitarian aid and COVID-19 vaccines. At the same time, Biden could convey good faith and dangle the offer of a summit in a letter to Kim. Most of these measures were already implemented or on the table during the Trump negotiations, and none would materially undermine U.S. national security. This approach would also keep denuclearization as a long-term U.S. goal but would not require it as an immediate concession for U.S. accommodation. These moves have their risks. But these can be mitigated. Employing so-called snapback provisions clauses that reimpose sanctions if a country fails to comply with an agreement, when offering sanctions relief protects against the risk of noncompliance. An end-of-war declaration could be negotiated so it has no legal effect on the Armistice Agreement and the United Nations Command, UNC, the U.S.-led international force that fought against North Korea and China during the Korean War whose legitimacy is challenged by North Korea. China, and Russia, until certain security milestones are achieved. U.S.-South Korean military exercises could be pared down to reduce their provocative aspects, such as the deployment of carrier strike groups and strategic bombers and threats of decapitation strikes against North Korean leadership, without meaningfully sacrificing military readiness. But ultimately, Washington must take calculated risks to escape the current quagmire. That's all for this time. Thank you for watching.